Welcome to this video where I'm going to discuss and show you how you can actually use Saturn's rings to calculate the mass of a moon that's in orbit around Saturn as well. Now we can't go and pick a moon up and measure it on some scales to get the mass but there are different ways in which we can use to calculate the mass and one of them for Saturn at least is to use its rings to find out the mass of the moon itself. Now if we have a look at the rings they're not smooth there are things like spirals, there are waves, there are gaps in there. And these are predominantly caused by moons either inside the rings or moons orbiting around the outside. And we can use the way that they interact with the rings and also the other way around as well, actually, to calculate the mass of the moon. We can also calculate properties of the ring if we look at the, if we know the mass of the moon and all the things and like that, and we can work out the actual interactions between the two, really. So if we have a look a bit closer, you've got things like these spiral density waves. And these particular ones here, when you zoom in, are created by resonances with outside moons. So moons orbiting around the outside of the rings, they are orbiting with some ratio to the time it takes for a particle in that ring to go around. So let's say we have a moon orbiting, it takes one orbital period to go round, but a ring particle at that location might go round twice. So what happens there is they pass by each other at the same location each time, they get a gravitational tug, and it causes a, a gravitational perturbation at the same point in its orbit. So it causes a resonance, and it causes features like this really. So you can get these things like spiral density waves, which manifest themselves a little bit like this. You can also get things like vertical structures. So right on the edge of some of the rings, you can see these structures going straight up from the ring. Now the rings themselves are quite thin and quite, well they're not thick at all, they are on the order of meters, when actually the rings themselves are hundreds of thousands of kilometers wide. So they're very, very thin. Yet these vertical structures at the edge can go kilometers high. Now these are caused by small moonlets so these are not quite moons they're quite small so you know, 100 meter sort of size maybe and they are gravitationally scattering things vertically and it could also be from waves at the ring edge as well which is causing things to be thrown upwards you then also got gaps now this is the one i'm interested in for this particular video because we have moons inside the rings and they create a gap. So gravitationally, they can clear out the material and it's going to relate to their mass. So we can use these gaps to find the mass of these actual moons. So what happens is you've got this moon inside the ring and it has some mass, which means it's exerting a gravitational force on the ring and it essentially scatters or it clears out a gap all the way around the ring. And the bigger it is, the more gravitational force it exerts on the ring and it's going to do it's going to have more of an impact basically so it gravitationally clears out a gap any material nearby it will change the orbit of that ring material so that it's no longer in the same orbital direction as the moon itself now a good example actually here is these two moons and you can see you've got two gaps and two moons the two moons are different sizes so one is about eight kilometers in size and one is about 30 kilometers in size. And then you've got two gaps, one at about 40 kilometers and one at just over 300 kilometers. And you can see that the bigger the moon, the bigger the gap, which again should make more sense. The bigger the moon, the more gravitational interaction or gravitational force is going to exert on the ring and it can basically distort it more. It can clear out a bigger gap the bigger it is. So this is a key thing here that we're going to use to then find a, an expression or find out how we can use that to find the mass of the moon. So the thing we really need to focus on here is the Hill Sphere. So if you haven't come across the Hill Sphere bef before, it is a sphere around an object which dominates the attraction of smaller objects. So a good example is going to be Earth. So if we've got Earth, there's going to be some area around it where other smaller objects are going to be gravitationally bound to it or be dominated by the gravity of Earth and not the gravitational force of the Sun. And the Moon sits inside that sphere of influence, that hill sphere, basically. So in order for you to have an orbit bound to an object, it has to be inside 
the heel sphere. So that's basically what it is. And that accounts for all of our objects. So you can do that for a moon as well. It would just be smaller for a smaller object than a larger object. And if you want the mathematics for that, then it's given by this here. So the, the hill radius relates to the separation between the two objects, which is the semi-major axis, and is written as A in the equation above. And then it relates to the mass of the two objects. So you've got the mass of the larger object and the mass of the smaller object. And if you change the masses, the ratios of those, it changes the hill sphere. If you put them closer together, it's going to decrease that hill sphere and things like that. So this is how it relates and how we would get it. So going back to Saturn's rings, the gap width created by one of these moons in the rings itself is proportional to the hill radius. So we've already got an equation for the hill radius. We can measure that gap width. We know that it's going to be proportional to that. And more specifically for Saturn, it actually relates to a, a gap half width is about 3.8 times the hill radius of the moon in the gap. So again, we can measure the gap half width. We would know things like the mass of Saturn and the distance where it is. So we could then actually calculate the mass of the moon. So we can basically write the gap half width like this here, because we would just times it by 3.8. So the gap half width is given by 3.8 times this semi-major axis and then you take the cube root of the mass of the moon over three times the mass of Saturn and that would be our gap half width and the only thing we don't know in that equation is the mass of the moon so what we would actually do so first we're going to go for the full gap width because we can measure the full gap width there or we can leave it as the half one we just half it so there we've got the mass of the moon which is your lowercase m, the mass of Saturn, which is your, your uppercase, and then a, which is the distance where the gap is from the center of Saturn. So we would know where that is. And rearranged for the mass of the moon, we would have this. So again, mass of Saturn, we would, all, we would know because we've calculated that through different methods. We would know the distance of the gap from the center of Saturn because we know the dimensions of the rings and things like that. And the full gap width is something we would actually measure. So again, these were seen with the Cassini spacecraft, which is no longer there, but we could quite easily measure the full gap width. And that's easier to measure than the size of the moon because it's actually bigger than the moon. The moon's going to be smaller and it's going to be harder to see. So once we do all that, the only thing we don't know is the mass of the moon. And we can actually get a good approximation for that mass purely from these things here. Even if we can't see the moon, we can get a good idea for its mass using this method. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoy, then check out some of the other videos.